Hey, welcome to another episode of Coach's Corner University. I'm doing the intro today because I'm the alpha and Tony's the beta. <laughs> <laughs> and we're joined by uh, Tony Rogers, uh, owner of Reset Athletics, director of sports performance. He has a doctorate in chiropractic and uh, he is a strength coach. So Tony Montgomery, how are you today? I'm doing good, man. Just got done with some jujitsu and drinking a Mountain Dew and recovering. That sounds great. And Tony Rogers, how are you doing today, man? Thanks for coming. I'm great. Thanks to you guys for both having me. Oh, it's our pleasure. It's our pleasure. You've been, um, you know, we, with the Florida powerlifting scene, you've been around for, for quite a bit, both as a, as a lifter and as a, a practitioner and putting out a lot of great content online. But as you mentioned earlier, you've never been on a podcast before. No, sir. First time. Yeah, well, I'm glad because I think a lot of people need to know kind of what you do. And, and I'm wondering if we could start just by kind of giving us a little bit of a background story of how you started Reset, how you went into chiropractic, that sort of thing. Okay. Um, I've always been fascinated by sports, movement, uh, fitness. And uh, my first couple of years in college or university, I was doing more of criminal justice and law. And I was playing college football. Uh, I got hurt pretty bad. And so... My family was like, we should see our family chiropractor. I was kind of, uh, how do you want to say, arrogant because I didn't think he'd be able to help me because mm -hmm. um, I didn't know any better. And at that time, you know, I didn't know Kairos did body work, uh, soft tissue, trigger point, functional movement, and like that. All I knew is they did adjustments. And I was like, it's not my bone, it's something muscular. Uh, boy, was I wrong. The guy took me in, open arms. Uh, he said, give me two weeks. He gave me two weeks, he gave me my life back. I could jump higher, I could run faster. I could perform at a high level. I got to learn what to do, how to do it. And so I switched majors. Uh, so I started to major in biology, still graduated with four years. And I went out and did my doctorate in California. And then I just latched on to everybody, and anybody and still do. So I'm, I'm a sponge. I want to learn. Mm -hmm. And uh, then, so did you go right from, right from your DC to starting your own business? No. So I went to, I worked under a doctor here in Florida for a couple of years. I wanted to learn. Uh, I got to the point where my grandfather always said, you should never ask for a raise. Um, if you feel like you're good enough at what you do, it's okay to quit and go do your own thing. So I put my two weeks in, uh, terrifying like most, and mm -hmm. I gave her hell. That's awesome, man. And so how long was it? So you started the clinic and then the clinic expanded to the gym or did you always have a gym? Yeah. So I was privileged um, right out of school. I got to work under this doctor he was uh, very involved with all these pro athletes. Uh, so I got to work on Ferraris all day, right? And I got to see my work perform on field, got to see the cars drive, right? I, I love using analogies to help people learn and understand. And so when I got to see the Priuses, like, you know, the normal people or gen population, mm -hmm. I was already sped up. I already knew how to change the oil. I already knew how to change the wipers. I already knew why the tires weren't turning. I already, you know, and so it was a uh, very fun in the sense of, if I could help them, I could help them. But some days the actual Prius was the Ferrari, you know? So like the pro athletes were actually pretty easy to work on or fix or help out. Mm -hmm. And then the normal pop was a lot harder because ergonomically they're not using what we should be using for function. Right. All right. So how did you get involved in like the lifting community? Cause actually, actually backtrack, you did your DC in California. Did you go to school? You went to school with Jordan, the Jordans, didn't you? Yep, with uh, Jordan Junta and Jordan Cello. Yes, yeah. Sir. Okay, cool. Small world. Um, so when you, sorry, where I was going with this is like, so you were always a lifter or did that come yeah. after the fact? I've been lifting since I was 16. So I've been powerlifting IPF. Um, I did very well at a young age. I lifted mm -hmm. it in the 132, 148. Um, I still have a couple national records at that. Nice. Um but to me, it's just knowledge with mileage. You know what I mean? It's not uh, a boost on anybody. It's just, you know, hey, I'm 132. I benched 260. And then I benched 365 with a shirt. Or, you know, it just shows that, hey, you know, understanding scapular stability is important for shoulder mobility. I love being able to bring back that mileage or knowledge to show that, hey, it actually does work. And mm -hmm. I didn't know why it worked until I actually actually learned more about it. Yeah, that's something we always we always come back to on the podcast and in, in all of our our you know, lectures and, and instruction is like, unless you've actually practiced what you preach, you don't really bring much to the table. Exactly. But there's nothing wrong with those people or that population or that knowledge. But to me, I, just under, I don't understand how you say this works, but you've never squatted over 300. 
So like when I, when I teach and I talk, I understand certain things, you know, why they don't work the way they should, but I'm not going to go out of my way to be like, no, this is the only way I'm like, what do you know about it? Can we modify and can we bring it together? So you have a bit more of like an open mind when you come to it. It's like not disparaging anyone, but mm-hmm. at the same time, you know, bringing, bringing the notion of expertise and experience to the yes. table as well. Yes. Do you, 100%. do you think at some point, like, if you're going to be a practitioner, you have to be a, you know, a participant, like you have to actually have to you know, perform to some degree. Um, yes and no. Um, I've met a lot of practitioners that are very good at what they do, but never had experience in powerlifting, but new movement and functional screening, because you got a member, you have things like ground force, right? The every day that you walk. So mm-hmm. for example, my best example I use is like the yoke. If you weigh 200 pounds, and at 1.5 ground force, that's almost 350 pounds of ground force at each knee. And you add that 300 pound yoke, that just tripled. Mm-hmm. So how do you understand that movement? So I got to learn from people like that and tie that in with what I already know, playing college football, powerlifting, um, the Olympic lifting because of football, that type of stuff. But to answer your question, sorry, tangents. No, no, um, please. But uh, to answer that more is it's cool because when they don't know, you get that unbiased opinion. You know, mm-hmm. so like when I was in clinic, I'd be like, what would you do for the knee? This is what I think. And I'd get this whole other prognosis or protocol and I'd be like fascinating. So I was obsessed with that at day one. When I started my doctorate program in California, I went for the head guys. I went for the Cairo of the Oakland Raiders. I went for the chiropractor of the 49ers. I was like, these guys are successful. Why would I want to create something new? I want to use what they're using. Right. So you end up getting into this position where you're learning from the best and then you have, you already have a knowledge of framework and practice around your own kind of scope and yes, then you, blend, you blend it as, as best that you can. And, and you guys are uh, perfect two examples. I've gotten a lot of your athletes, right? First yeah. thing I say is I say, Hey, does Paul know you're working with me? Cause I never want to compete. I want to complete. So if that mm-hmm. athlete's like, no, it's not going well with Paul and I, I said, well, you need to talk to them first uh, and see what's <laughs> going on. Or, hey, it's not going well with Tony. No, 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 well. that, that never happens. No, no, that never no, no. happens. Tony's perfect. I'm just, I'm just giving examples, all right? Yeah. So if it's not going well with the coach, I'm like, there's your problem right now. It's the communication. Mm-hmm. That coach doesn't know that you're not going doing good because he only assumes because he hasn't heard from you. Yeah, no, that's and a I, great point, man. I see that happen all the time where uh, people reach out to me and they're like, yeah, I'm working with so-and-so. And, uh, you know, things aren't just going the way they, I thought they would. And I'm like, have you actually talked to your coach about where things are going? I'm like, no, I, I thought I'd talk to you first. I'm like, what do you mean? Talk to me first. Like, did you and your coach have a good uh, meet last time? You're like, yeah, we added 50 pounds, but now it's not going well. It's like, well, talk to your coach, right? Like if you can't communicate with your coach and then you go behind their back to communicate with me, what's going to happen when we hit a rough patch, you're going to go try to find other people as well and not communicate with me. It's like, it's just a bad precedent to, to set. Right. But mm-hmm. it's, it, it happens all the time. Communication is, is the key, especially when it comes from your um, set of skills. Right. I've talked to people so many times where it's like, Hey, tell me exactly where the pain starts from what's going on. And they're like, Oh, it's just like in this area here. I'm like, okay, well, we're really not going to be able to get much done with this type of, of nomenclature and communication is because, you know, then, then you have to completely refine it. And if they don't know much about the human body, I'm just like, Hey, this is not my area. And you know, there's other people that are better, but if they're very fine tuned with the human body, then we can actually like make some small adjustments here and there and and tinker. But you know, the idea of communication is, is so important to tell people where exactly things are going wrong and, and what is the driving cause of that. Absolutely. I'm sure it's a little bit easier too when you're dealing with athletes who have coaches and coaches who are open to communication. Like, you know, you send me messages like, hey, so-and-so has this issue. This is what I think is going to happen. Or they'll give me a report from you and saying like, this is what I want to do. And then I can just build it into the program. It's really easy. Um, But that type of care, that type of more nuanced viewpoint of the athlete as a whole takes way more time. So how did you managed to escape the whole notion of, you know, I'm a, I'm a chiropractor, 15 minutes, snap, crackle, pop, see you later, and actually build a business around this, you know, athlete communication, holistic mm-hmm. approach and movement, like active movement. Cause a lot of people associate chiropractic with passive interventions. 
Right. But a lot of the stuff you're putting out is active. Like I remember I messaged you about, a, about my knee and hip and you're like, I want you to do these things. And none of it was passive. None of it was like, I want you to lay on a foam roller for three hours. No, <laughs> no. Yeah. Well, it's different though. Cause everybody, like, I think of it as like ingredients, like Paul, yeah. for example, you could be salt and pepper. Tony could be, I know you guys got tough skin, so I can pick on you a little bit. Tony could be cayenne, pepper, mustard, Spicy. ketchup, and a little bit of diet Mountain Dew. Right. But the okay. resolution or the results always going to be the same. So how can we get you there? Everybody's different. So for me, I got really bored during my lunch hours in the clinic because we had a two hour lunch and I didn't know what to do. So I started doing these video evals and like watching videos. And I did it with the pros all day, every day because the NFL combine, I, I do the combine still. So I had to watch these videos, the sprints, the speed, uh, how force, you know, the mass and acceleration. I'm like, it applies the same way to the conjugate or lifting or periodization or Bulgarian or whatever it is. So with that, during the videos, I got sped up because for two years, that's why I do it at lunch. And um, Trevor Jaffe would be like, hey, you got to start putting this stuff out there. And I was kind of like, why? And he's just like, people need this. They need you. And I was kind of like, really? Like, you know, because I thought everybody knew kind of what I knew. And I was like, all right, let's do it. So I started putting videos out there and, you know, and it just took off like wildfire. And I was helping. I tried to build a demand like Google and Yahoo mm -hmm. and like eBay, you know, have a search engine. So I helped over 3000 people for free. Um, and I still keep up with them. Um, I don't charge them. I just don't feel like it's fair because they're my OGs that created me or helped me get to where I am, helped me keep going to where I am. Uh, so it's pretty cool. I have them all recorded and saved their injuries of progression. Uh, so no, you know, uh, so it's just, a, it's fascinating to watch how stuff grows. And so that took off to the point where I was doing house calls, doing my own thing. And then I was like, let's make a lab. So I made a gym. So if you ever get to come down here, I'd love to have you both. Mm -hmm. um, I am going to start doing meets. Uh, Ryan Connolly and I just became state chair for the RPS. So hopefully we can grow powerlifting and continue to grow it here in Florida. Uh, but uh, I'm trying to have everything in here two of everything in the sense of, so people come, they don't have to wait. I don't want that commercial gym feel. I want people to come in be able to work out uh, while I'm working my normal, you know, I work eight days a week. I know there's only seven, but when I'm working, I love it because I can take the people out of the treatment center or the clinic and take them into the gym and do the actual application. I get to see the car drive. That's the biggest mm -hmm. thing, you know? So like you ever take a car in and it doesn't work when you take it out, you're kind of like, man, I got to take it back in right away. Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't like that philosophy. I want to be so potent in a treatment that you're like, Hey, there's change. And I want to have that communication and that ice broken that you'll never hurt my feelings. Cause I don't have any in the treatment. When we all go out and get drinks or food or, um, hang out in the gym. Then we can, you know, BS and have fun. But in here, it's just, it's, it's all game time. You know what I mean? I'm here to help you not take advantage of you. I like that. I think, I think Tony would be more liable to come visit you now that <laughs> given the current constraints on uh, on the world but uh yeah it's, it's really interesting i i'm you mentioned something about like putting out content you're like oh i feel like people know what i know and i think we get uh we get caught in this in this world of like well i surround myself with people who are all trying to get better and trying to learn and trying to grow and they all know what i know to a certain extent so i assume that the rest of the world knows the same thing but the reality is if Tony and I put out a video on a certain topic. We would both attack it differently. We might cover the same subject matter, but we'll attack it differently and it might resonate with two different people. So approaching you know, the business with this growth mindset of, I want more people to do what I do to bring more eyes to what we're doing as a whole, because if more great people keep contributing to our industry, the industry will undoubtedly grow. Work with me, not for me. So I'll, I'll die with that. Yeah, man. And, uh, and, and that's what we try to do as well. So I was, um, wanted to chat about kind of your approach to, uh, onboarding a client. So I know you do a lot of virtual stuff. Tony and I are, you know, work a lot in the virtual world and, you know, I have my way of, of onboarding clients where, you know, the initial block of training or a period of training is a bit of an assessment in itself a build in kind of gatekeeper exercises of, you know, end ranges of motion and seeing if we can control our bodies. But I'm wondering how you go about onboarding a client um, within, you know, the, the people that reach out to you. Mm -hmm. So for that, I am, uh, I'm very patient. I always say, I don't need you. I want you. Um, I believe if you need somebody, it becomes a monetary value and people start to uh, take advantage of certain services. Okay. So I, I make that clear, Barry, at the front. 
I find out if you have a coach or if you don't have a coach or what your direction is, what your plan is. Uh, I love it when you do have a coach because it makes my life a lot easier because I'm instantly like communication. Have you guys been talking? No, we haven't. When's the last time we talked to him? It's been two weeks. All right, let me reach out to the coach because most of these coaches I know, hey, do you know so-and-so? I didn't even know they signed up. I'm like, something's wrong. There's a misconnect. So once those guys can reconnect, all of a sudden mm-hmm. that's solved, you know, so I didn't even gain a client, but to me, that's more important than that, you know? Um, Cause then now that coach realizes I was looking out for him. So hopefully that will become a referral or vice versa. Right. But to get back on onboarding a new client, same thing. I bet them, I want to hire them because I know if they have a coach, they're dedicated. They're going to do the program because all I'm doing is mirroring your program or whatever the coach is doing. So, and depending on the injury, because if you're squatting, right, that squat is a, compound movement if you're deadlifting it's compound movement but with a hip hinge you can already tell what injuries are going to be more prevalent and the stances that they do and the volume that they're doing so it's cool because i've been exposed to so many programs um hybrid performance paul uh tony you trevor jaffe jailhouse strong chad wesley smith um the ai systems uh the bulgarian uh shaiko and people don't realize like every time i get a program or new coach baby i'm learning I'm like, oh, I love this recipe. I know what you're doing. Um, recently, right now, I've been privileged to work with uh, Mr. Eddie Cohn. I've learned so much in a fast period of time. I'm um, doing nutrition with uh, Ian, uh, Ian Daniels with Fortitude uh, Performance. Again, learning so much. Like, I'm a sponge. So, all that helps me help that individual in one. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. For sure. For sure. Yeah, but so, can you take us through kind of like the, the needs analysis that you go through, right? You get a lifter, they come to Oh, absolutely. They want to work with you. What are, what are you looking at? Are you, are you, you sending, are they sending you videos? Do you have them doing drills that you can watch so you can see, do you have like yep. some type of a assessment that you use? What, what exactly are the, the things that you're doing in the very beginning to analyze? Yeah. So very beginning, uh, pain, what's going on, uh, squats, how recent they are, um, how long they've been doing the program with the coach, what's going on with that. And then depending on how long the pain's been going on, uh, if there's any kind of trauma, I don't deal with trauma. So if they were hit like on the football field, I'm um, instantly refer out. You got to go get x-rays, MRI, got to get that first. If it's more a functional, that's a little bit different because it's a misuse of stability and a misuse of some kind of mobility with the kinetic chain. So then I'm getting the videos. I want the videos of the top sets of whether it's a squat bench or deadlift or overhead press, wherever the athlete is. And once I can see that, I can see the limitation or the deficit or dysfunction. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. it's I can see everything kind of in slow motion so what I do for the coaches I also do a coach academy um, so the coaches what I do is I slow down the videos already and I send them to the coaches so the coaches can see holy crap the knee is breaking over the toe where the hip is going back it is the upper back that's causing the misfunction of the hip or the immobility does that make sense so mm-hmm. like I hope I, I want to co- I want to teach the coach so the coach can use me as a resource and not as a dependent so then also the coach can come back, hey, I got this problem with this athlete. Can you check it out? 100%. We go over it together. But if it's just an individual person, it's all video evaluation. Um, I usually pinpoint the spot for like the problem or dysfunction. I send them a picture of whether it's the shoulder, posterior, anterior, if it's rotator, uh, for the knee, hamstring, whatever it is. Because like you said, Tony, earlier, we got to know what's going on. Because people easily can go, it's, it's, it's here. All right, so what's there? Does it hurt with flexion? Does it hurt with extension? And then I relate it to more of, uh, extension, the sense of reaching back or like a squat if you're external, because a lot of people don't know that jargon or verbiage. Do you have a lot any of, type of, uh, assessment or anything like that, that you do? Yeah. Or... A lot of, a lot of the rehab stuff. So like for Paul example, I know you did some too, as well, uh, for the actual like videos, when they do it, some of the videos aren't meant to produce pain or alleviate pain. I want to actually see if you can do it. So a lot of times I'll say, Hey, send me a video of that link. I sent you. I want to see you performing it. Cause I can actually see the restriction. If I can see the restriction. Now that restriction is based on the next videos I send you. Okay. So it's an iterative process, right? Like you're, you're kind of giving them some, some homework, seeing what they come back with, updating the homework, seeing what they come back with and so on and so forth. How often are you typically seeing, uh, seeing clients or communicating with clients to update their plans for the virtual. Yeah. Virtual uh, communication day to day. I have a 48 hour policy because I want people to have the right to their, get their own time. Uh, most times I do respond within that six to 12 hour window. I do travel a lot. I do work full time. Uh, so I want people to realize that if I disappear, it's because I'm doing a podcast or if I disappear, it's because I'm working on somebody. They're not, it's not because they're not important it's because I am doing something else throughout the day. 
Uh, so when I do do the feedback, it is daily. So most times I do respond within a six to 12 hour uh, time frame, And then that's with the videos. And I try to communicate with that person as fast as I can, and as long as I can. So for example, if you and I are having a conversation, I'm going to mm -hmm. end your conversation, understanding that you know what to do for your knee. I'm not going to just disappear. You're like, yeah, man, that stretch with the knee worked great. Also, I'm gone for two days. I'm like, all right, how did it work great? What's going on? That's a uh, kickback on the inner that vestibular Alice felt unbelievable. Awesome. How the squats feel really good. Everything good, dude. I'm great. All right, man. I'll talk to you tomorrow. And I go on to the next one. So that makes sense too. Yes. It would, it, so in saying that I'm like, okay, well, this guy's working really hard on his clients. He's putting in a lot of time. Like he must not be able to carry many clients, but the perception online is that you're like working with everybody. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I have a very, a very thick abundance of people. Um, it's, it's, it's fun. It's a lot of fun. Like anything though, it takes time. And if we can get specific in that organization, that's why my OCD, when I was talking to you guys, I don't want to waste your time. I kind of want to have a heads up so I can answer the questions because I love talking about this stuff, but I want to stay on topic. So same thing with the work and staying organized. Yeah. Yeah. What, so what are some of the, the common um, issues that you see with, with powerlifters? Cause there has to be a lot of commonalities because we're only doing three lifts and there's not a lot of variation within those lifts. So what are some of the common issues that you see often with, with lifters that, that you're evaluating on a day-to-day -day basis? Yeah, that's, what's fascinating. It's a, uh, it's kind of cool because you can tell by the program, by the pain and no knock on the program, but you can tell like, for example, knee pain, the, the girl squatting three days a week. All right. Are you a novice? Are you intermediate? You know, no, I'm a novice. I'm just learning this. That's a lot of frequency. Do they understand your max? Uh, so I see a lot of knees. I see a lot of shoulders. Um, so, uh, sorry, sorry to interrupt, but like, yeah, so ahead. with the, with the beginner, right. With the higher frequency stuff, is it the higher frequency that's creating the issue or is it the, the squat mechanics that are creating the issue? Right. Tech, Cause tech technique, hundred percent. So then in order to get a lifter to have better technique, what would you, what would you recommend a regression in frequency or right? Cause mm -hmm. you would think with beginners, a higher frequency is going to allow them to master the technique a little bit better. Cause they'll be fresher every time they go in. But you're saying that if you have a beginner with higher frequency, that that could be a telltale sign that the program's creating some of that dysfunction. So how would you approach that lifter so that they're still getting in that skill acquisition and frequency but also fixing their, their knee pain at the same time. Like, what are you, what are you implementing? What are you taking away? Are you regressing patterns? Are you like, what exactly are you trying to do fundamentally with someone like that? Yeah. So a perfect example for them, what I would do is I like to see each day, right? I wouldn't have them go up to the top percent. If the pain is going persisting, I don't want them to make the pain worse or provoke it. But uh, for the regression, I would see, so if they're squatting like a Monday, Wednesday and a Friday, right? Regardless if it's a high bar, low bar SSB. Uh, so what they're doing what I would do is I get rid of the stretch reflex in the sense of I let them box squat all three days to get really comfortable with just to push, just to push. Cause a lot of people don't realize how to use the preload and they dive bomb it or they go too slow and they go on their toes, not getting the distribution right in the foot. So the easiest way to do it is you get rid of the eccentric or preload by just maintaining the concentric. All of a sudden knee pain starts to disappear or alleviate. Now you introduce them back to their normal program and then bring them back to the box. You can do a two week wave undulation, whatever you want to do. So with a, with a box squat like that, with trying to alleviate the knee pain, are you having them do more of a positive shin angle, hips back type of squatting, or are you allowing them to squat with the pattern that they normally squat with? Um, but if that, I guess if that pattern is the dysfunction, then you would have to change that pattern. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I like to do a little bit higher box squat. So that'll keep them focusing on the quads, understanding how to use the quads to extend the knees. Cause if you extend the knees then the glutes come through for that contraction, it's a push and a pull. So okay. if you go too low, if you go too low, they're not going to understand that push and the knees are going to knock and everything's going to go very bad, very fast. So you'd rather regress, you'd rather regress the, the range of motion rather than regress the frequency of the lift. Yes. Now, yeah. the way I look at it, right, in terms of, of injuries and, and prevention of that is <clears throat> not so much to regress the lift, but more so to, to kind of think about the biomechanics of the lift and fix that with either slowing down the lift by doing longer eccentrics or doing some isometric work in the bottom of the lift or something along those lines. 
and then find an exercises outside of that squat to alleviate some of that stress and, and pain, right? Mm -hmm. Thinking about it in terms of maybe they need more hamstring work because if their hamstrings are weak, their quad's gonna start pulling on the, the patella a little bit more and that's where that pain could be coming from or thinking about it in terms of, you know, isometrics in a lunge position has been shown throughout the literature to alleviate some knee pain as well. So doing that type of stuff, more isometric based things, more overcoming isometrics and along those lines to alleviate some of that knee pain, or maybe their, their quads are the issue. I never, I, I tend not to think about it in terms of regression patterns of the exercise, but how can we add in other exercises to alleviate some of that pain instead of, of regressing the, the exercise in and of itself? Yeah, this, this is very early for me. So in the sense of like that example, it's like a template, right? There's a lot of these templates that are out there that people are paying for. And I always like, you gotta be careful what you pay for. If you pay less, you're not gonna get the same quality return. It's okay, but you understand why you're paying for this. If I'm paying 20 bucks for this three day squat program, you don't really know the purpose. So me, I wanna teach them that education. So it could possibly be an upsell. It could be a possibly a referral to a coach, right? Hey, you'd be a great fit for so-and-so. But to answer your question with that, the neuro gain, the neuromuscular education is number one. I agree the technique. So I like to do the box to see if I'm correct in the sense of if it actually is the knee that's causing the pain or if it's actually the immobility in the hip. Because a lot of times when you do the box, it is a controlled isometric, right? You sit, so it's gotta be that slight pause. I'm not saying you get loose like a conjugate with the briefs on, you still gotta be tight. But if you sit and then if you were to pick the feet up and then drive the floor to stand up, you have to engage all those muscles, the correct muscles where a lot of times if there's a preload or miss eccentric load, they come down on the toes and they don't really even realize how to use their hips. So I use it as more of a test to see if it's actually the problem because I'm not going to make them do a three day box squat and they're in their hypertrophy or strength block doing 85, 75, whatever it is. I'm not going to go, Hey, we're going to do this. I want to see on a warm up going up. Hey, how's that feel? It actually feels really good. Now you can address the mobility or the functional movement or the regression. And you would find that that regression based model of, of a box squat would be better than regressing down to maybe a counterbalance squat that still allows them to do the squat in full. Because my, my thought process is if you have them doing a, a box squat and they're not able to get the entire range of motion and that entire range of motion is where some of that deficit lies, why would you take that range of motion out and then reintroduce it thinking that they fixed the issue, right? Like if they're having issues with the technique and they're having issues coming onto their toes as they get into the hole, why take coming into the hole out of the equation, so to speak, right? Why not just do a counterbalance squat? Because that, that mind motor, that'd be the progression, right? So that mind mm -hmm. motor is one of the most powerful things. If you're already defeated here because you had a bad day, pain grows exponentially. So if you could bring that box and understand, they're like, oh, the pain's gone or it's less. What in the world? So now when you do the secondary, like the counterbalance, or if you do like the isometrics or the lunges or the elevated Bulgarian, whatever you want to do for that recipe for them, right? Now all of a sudden they're, they're back. They're back in the game going, he knows what he's doing. So you're, so you're a, trying to, a, you, sorry, sorry, go, go ahead, Tony. I was going to say, so your train of thought is find that initial exercise to alleviate the pain so that whenever they're going through the rest of the stuff, the pain isn't necessarily the thing that's um, kind of turning everything else off. And the pain's not the thing that's, uh, allowing them to misrepresent the the technique so to speak you're you're saying that that's kind of the the route that you go initially uh somewhat yes but to me okay. it's a, a protocol i've used that's worked very fast because like i said i have a lot of people that i get to work with so i found out that doing a box squat or doing a single leg pistol concentric squat things that like that you turn off that eccentric load it speeds up the process for me understanding what's wrong so yeah, I'm, not, it's, it's, I'm not saying they're doing an entire week, two weeks of this box squat. I'm doing it as an orthopedic test so I can see what's going on because I can see what's going on. It's like I'm in the gym. I go, yep, another one. It's uh, knee plica or whatever the problem is, uh, mistracking of the patella because the lateral quads way too tight. They're not using your hamstrings, what you said, Tony. It, it's interesting because so one thing that I did want to discuss today, and it, it's been something that I've been looking into quite a bit and, and, and I get exposed to a lot having worked in disability is pain. Okay. The multifactorial representation of, of the human experience of pain. And so within your approach to this problem is, okay, how can I get this person out of pain, have them experience some sort of victory so that we can start to build momentum towards rebuilding their pattern or, or getting them back into the full movement as quickly as possible. But I wanna get them out of pain 
first. Um, one thing that the research is quite clear on is that when you're in pain, performing the movement that you that was putting you in pain to whatever degree you can, avoiding the pain or avoiding exacerbating the pain is going to be uh, the best bet. But we also know that pain is extremely subject, subjective in terms of like, if I sleep poorly, my pain is gonna be higher. If I'm stressed, if I'm depressed, if I'm anxious, if I'm scared, like all of these things will impact my perception of pain. Now within, <clears throat> within powerlifting, like everything we do hurts, right? Like if you're lifting a max squat, max deadlift, max bench press, you're gonna be in some measure of pain. So I often will get clients being like, oh, hey, by the way, like I had some tightness in my pec. I'm like, okay, let's look at your program and let's modify the loading a little bit. No, no, it's, it's, it's just a little tightness. I'm like, well, are you in pain? Or are you not? Like, how do you address pain with your clients in a more of like, I mean, we call it uh, edu like an educational between like pain and like discomfort and pain. Like what the mm -hmm. difference between those two things are. Yeah. So that's the biggest thing is differentiating between uh, soreness and pain. Cause you know, when we work out, we do get that DOMS, delayed onset, whatever you want to call it, uh, the new neural stimulation. So the biggest thing is I like to do is I like to do, is it a five? Is that below a five or above a five? Right. And then people start thinking, what do you mean on a pain scale? Yes, exactly. So, oh, it's like a six. So that's a big deal to me. If it's above mm -hmm. a five, it's a big deal. Whether yeah. you have a high pain tolerance, you don't, whatever it is. If it's above a five, that's a problem. When mm -hmm. it's below a five, it's more of a nuisance. A nuisance is still a problem, right? But it's more of a thing that's been lingering. You know, you have that acute, you have that chronic. Um, a lot of times, if we get educated on the sense of like Golgi tendons, like a GTO mm -hmm. and the muscle spindle, right? What's, what's going to have more pain, right? The tendon or the muscle? The misuse of the muscle pulling on that tendon is going to cause a lot more disproportionate in pain. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So like if you have the kneecap, right, if the quads are too tight, think how much tension and torque is getting pulled on that patellar tendon. Mm -hmm. So what can we do? Reciprocal inhibition, right? If the quad's tight, it means the hamstring's inactive. So if we can turn on the hamstring with that secondary work, or if we can elongate or dynamically or statically or ballistically, whatever works best for you, all of a sudden things change dramatically. Everybody's different. Um, I have no problems with static, ballistic, dynamic, it's just understanding how to use it and when to use it. So with a client like that for the chest pain, right? hundred percent, let's keep her with the chest tightness. Let's keep a look at it, right? So you're watching the videos, you can see them countering or rotating, windmilling. You're like, all right, we're not getting that scapular stability. That's why you're getting that torque in the chest. Let me see how you do on a T-bar row, or let's see how you do on a, a single arm, you know, bent over lat pull, right? man, that, that's awful on that side. It's so weak. It's not weak. It's just not turned on. So if you can catch it before it becomes above a five, guess what? Now it stays at a one. Right. All right. So it's, so it's very much like an education around like the faulty patterns that are leading people towards pain. How, how have you ever dealt with someone, you know, with, uh, okay, you're working with Ian now who's chron like chronically have, having back pain and SI issues for the last couple of years. Yep. How do you approach someone like that? Who's obviously has a high pain threshold, Correct. obviously has a high degree of strength. Correct. And he also has a high degree of motivation to get back into lifting. Did you like see, a, kind of an, did you see a 705 pull? I did. And that's kind of where I asked. I was like, well, I can still pull 705 with a bum SI joint. So and he, he uh, experienced no pain. So he's doing, he's doing very well. Um, just spoke him this morning. He's healing. He's healing very fast. Um, with that, though, the SI, especially with the experience, that's going to be more of the Ferrari, right? Mm -hmm. So that guy, if you, don't know, if you don't know your stuff, he's going to call you out on it type of thing. So those are the ones that are the most fun because now you got to be on your game because it keeps you on game with everybody. So with him, with that SI, it's a combination of, of a couple things, right? So we do a post-test, pre-test. So if you ever get treatment, it's luckily he lives in Florida and we are local. So I get to see him in person. So it speeds up everything because the videos mm -hmm. take a little bit longer because I don't actually get to touch, do assessment, you know, actually do manual therapy type of thing. Uh, so with him, it's pretty cool because I can actually do those videos that I would send you in person. So I work on something, I troubleshoot. I have you stand up. How's that feel? Wow. That changed a lot. 
Mm-hmm. Awesome. Lay back down. Now I know which direction to go. I'm going to go left the whole way. Right. Versus if he got up and he goes, I don't feel any change, but feels very, you know, defeated because he's supposed to feel change because I'm um, air quote Rogers reset. I help everybody. Right. So mm-hmm. why don't I feel change? That's the thing I want to, that's what I'm obsessed with is when there isn't change, because I'm like, that didn't work for you. So now I got to think of a different protocol, which I have in my head already. So we tried that direction. Austin gets up. Wow. That's different. Or, you know, like I said, vice versa, sometimes it doesn't help everybody and you have to be more important in the sense of those treatment sessions, or we have to do a couple more videos or we have to do a FaceTime. So with a guy like him, we got to troubleshoot. Then I let him go practice and play, but we reinforced, we did our single joint first while he did his main. So as you can see, he pulled that 705 out of a little bit of uh, adrenaline, a little bit of moxie, right? And he mm-hmm. texts me, he goes, hey, I'm sorry, I did something stupid, but I didn't, I didn't break our work. I didn't, you know, screw up what we've been doing. I actually feel really good. Interesting. <laughs> so be- before we get past the, the pain stuff, um, what, can, you, can you explain a little bit what the mechanisms of that pain reaction is? Because I know a lot of people who, who get injured and the injury is, is healed, but they still have pain. And that pain is not allowing them to fully produce as much force as they want, right? Like if you have a, a tissue. It's that phantom limb. Yeah, yes. Yeah, along those lines. Can you, can you explain that a little bit? And then how do, you, how do you get rid of that pain, right? How do you get rid of that issue once a muscle is fully healed? Like what are, what are some of the things that you're doing to, to integrate to, to relieve that pain? So that nerve regeneration, right, is one millimeter per year. So if you have things called dermatome and myotomes, dermatome is more of like the superficial, like the skin, right? Myotome is more of the muscle. So you get like into the Wexler, like muscle testing. That's why you see all these CBDs, uh, China gel. um, What else you got? Biofreeze, all these emollients that work so well because it numbs that sensation, right? Or you get like the corticosteroid shot. It works so well, right? I'm like, it worked great. Awesome. But we still got to do the rehabilitation. If you don't do rehabilitation, that bandaid is going to fall off. And guess what? That cut's going to be twice as big. And never actually healed. You use it as a crutch, not a tool. So to get more into the pain of the phantom limb, um, I, for example, I hurt my knee really bad in football, right? Every day, every day I know it's there, but I'm a zero out of 10. Um, I have a six millimeter disc herniation in my low back, right? L5, S1. I shouldn't be able to walk. That's from football again. Every day I know it's there. So I do my homework to reiterate those problems and keep them at bay. So when the dog starts to bark, I always put it back in the cage before it bites. I know what prognosis works for me. So I think pick up on my planks or my front squats if my back starts to ache. So to help with those people, once you find that recipe, it's, hey, we gotta stay on top of this. I'm not saying you have to do 30 exercises and that whole, uh, how they make funny, that spoof about ergonomics, how everybody's standing around being funny, like, you know, trying to be really aware. No, it's about having that reinforcement. Like uh, Eddie Cohen said it best, is making that shield, that armor, right? If you have the armor, guess what? If you get hit in that armor, it can fall off because you have so much more armor around you. Now you rebuild that while everything else reabsorbs. So yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so what you're saying is that the, maybe the pain just will never go away. It'll never, you'll never be able to exasperate yourself of it because right. Like I know Andrew Herbert tore his tricep and it took like two or three years for that pain to, to eventually go away, but it did go away. I know people that pull their quad and they'll have pain, but the quad's fully healed, right? Mm-hmm. But they're not able to fully express their output because the pain's there. So is there, so you're saying that the pain's just gonna linger and, and there's nothing you can do about no, it? Like, no, linger would be like more of one or two. Like right now, I'm zero out of 10 for everything. I'm just saying, I'm very aware of it. I'm not okay. timid, I just, I just know. And like, I know a lot of people that I've worked with and talked to, they're like, I feel really good, but I know certain things that, could provoke it that I don't do anymore because I've been brought to my attention. Right. So if you're going to squat heavy, right. If that car is performing at 200 miles per hour every day, all day. Right. And if you're wearing, for example, like the whole controversy with the heel, if you're wearing the heel for your squat, you have a lot more torque on your knee. So if you have a lot more torque on your knee, you have to do a lot more glute work. If you do a lot more glute work, right. And release that tightness in the knee, you end up hitting that 10 time body weight, John Hack. Yeah. Like, <clears throat> so I always relate this back to, uh, to, to my experience with disability. Cause we, we deal with that complex regional pain syndrome type stuff all the time. So you have an individual, usually low back injury or cervical spine injury where, you know, they have uh, like hypersensitivity to that area. And then long after the injury has healed, 
that pain, that like that mechanical injury is gone. So there's no more injury signal for pain, yet they still feel pain. And then it gets to the point where that pain like travels throughout their body. So I've had, I've had clients like, I had a, I had a client recently, she, her complex regional pain sy syndrome started with like low back pain and now she can't wear pants because her quads burn so much. Yeah. And uh, one thing that I've noticed with the kind of trend of what you've been saying is that the sooner we can get people back to movement, the better off we're going to be. So providing them with some sort of autonomy within the process to actually stack some wins. And if that takes us this corrective exercise soup to get them to a point where they've relieved tension on certain areas to move a little bit better, move without pain, as long as we keep that soup in the mix, they should be okay at what point, or do you get to a point where you rid yourself of that need to have the soup there? Like, do you ever get to a point where maybe I don't need to do these corrective exercises anymore? Cause like, that's pretty much where I am, man. Like I'm, I do probably 20, 30 minutes of corrective exercise every single day, mm -hmm. but my training's going great. So I kind of just do it. Right. But that's the thing too, is training's going great. So you're seeing the repercussion of you being honest with your homework. That corrective exercise could turn into your single joint though which is now your accessory. Mm. So my biggest thing is, is the hypertrophy, right? You can live in a hypertrophy block for the rest of your life. Like my mother, my father, right? They can do that for the rest of their life. They don't ever have to gain. They don't ever have to get stronger, bigger, right? But they are because depending on the caloric deficit, their goals, their needs analysis, what they could be doing is, hey, I just want to maintain this, but I've lost 15 pounds. Obviously they are raising, raising up the bar. So if they can bench hundred pounds, they're raising up to 115 but that 115 still stays in that true 75%. So they can still do 10s and 15s. I'm not saying they ever have to go to a single one RM, but hey, let's do the whole five pounds, five pounds every week. We'll go back down. We'll change our grip now to super wide, do the same thing. Five pounds, five pounds. You're already three months in, mm -hmm. you know, because you see all these people, these LA fitness, like nothing against it. It's just unfortunate because they don't have a direction. They're just going in, right? And that's the biggest thing you hear is, hey man, why don't you lift anymore? Oh, I don't lift because I got hurt. Well, what'd you do? Oh, I, went, I went super heavy. Why'd you go heavy? Well, it's been a couple of weeks. So I want to see where I was at. Yeah. You know, so I, to me, it's like, I hope to change that mindset of do 10 reps to see where you're at. It's not going to be exact, but it's going to be darn close. You know what I mean? Yeah. So what you're saying basically is like, you know, eventually I'll get to a point where I can put some of that corrective exercise into my assistance work and then you can, tra you can transition it. Yeah. Cause that's what, because that's what feeds your compound, correct? Your right. compound, wherever you're weak at in your compound is a power leakage. If you have a power leakage, that means you have some kind of instability or some kind of immobility. So now what do you do? You go and address it with a single joint. All of a sudden that single joint gets strong. Now it takes longer for that failure or dysfunction to appear. You just hit a PR. Paul, that was a great squat, man. Yeah, I got to do more single leg. What did you say? More biceps. More biceps. Or, bi or, bi or biceps. You know what I mean? Like More biceps. But like all of a sudden now you know all right, that's my weak link. So now that weak link starts to slow down and also now a new weak link starts to expose because you hit a, a number that's so high that your body's not capable of, it could be your upper back. Mm. Man, I can't go super narrow with my hands anymore because my bench is growing. So now what can I do? T-spine. Well, what's T-spine? T-spine's more seated rows, lat pull downs, narrow grip, variation. Now all of a sudden you go up again another wave, you evolve. Also now it's like, what do I do? Oh, I have to go back to my knee because my knee's been bothering me. See how it's growing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. So with the with the integration of like the the correctives into your actual program, what are you doing with your athletes to warm them up for their lifts, right? Because you hear a lot of people who will just say, "Hey, let's just go into the gym and just start squatting," and that's how we warm up for squats. But if you're someone who has an injury and you're integrating those correctives into your actual program, are you going to start replacing what you used to do with something else, or? How exactly are you having your, your people warm up? Is there, is there a rhyme or reason to it? Do you have them do, you know, some static stretches followed by some dynamic stuff, followed by some stability? Mm -hmm. Like how exactly are you having them, them do that? So the biggest thing with my warmups, like what I like to see is that I really like to see people take the bar, 45 pounds, right? They should be able to do that regardless gender, regardless age. They do 45 pound squat. All of a sudden they look at you and they're like, my knee's, my knee's a little weird today. All right, so now we do our protocol, right? The protocol is always the same for the leg, unless we need something new because we have a new injury present. 
So they do the protocol. Also, the knee feels great, right? So now they can start to climb. It's okay if, for example, they get to say 65% and they're like, hey, the knee's coming back, right? There's nothing wrong with going back to stretching that specific movement that you know alleviates it, right? Or doing that dynamic now to turn on that actual recruitment. So for me, I like doing a static first as almost assessment to see what's restricted because your daily life changes, right? So you could be sitting all day, but you might be sitting all day against a chair leaning and not even realize it. So you get to the gym, you're like, man, why am I so pitched forward? Because lifting and performance is all about replicating the movement every day exactly the same, right? So we can get better. Because if you change those variables, how do I know my squat's my true squat? So we have to control all variables to keep that growing. So if we can do a static for an assessment, they're like, okay, I feel really good with this assessment today. I can start squatting. So they don't necessarily have to spend 30 minutes on the warm up because they felt really good. Now they can actually go faster into it. But say next Monday, they're like, man, dude, everything was tight. Today took a little bit longer because I spent a little bit more time doing my static and doing my dynamic. My goal is eventually to get you to a dynamic warm up that you don't have to do the static, but you're doing a static as an assessment. So if you're doing the T-spine, it should take you no longer than two minutes because you went through your windmills, your corkscrews, whatever it was. Also, you're like, no, dude, I felt great. But that chest stretch, that T1 where I lay on my belly, I just spent a little more time there because, man, that lit me up. Perfect. I want them to use it as a reference, not as a, man, it took me 30 minutes. It's okay. Me, sometimes I do take 30 minutes because I want to be ready to rock and roll. I don't want to have an excuse when I get to my top set and go, I should have spent a little more time on that. I got to a point definitely where I was like, well, I got to warm up 45 minutes before I even train. And then I was like, well, there's something, there's something wrong here. Right. Right. Now, like now I'm definitely to the point, I have a much better understanding of things now. And, um, definitely to the point, like I can get to a top set, you know, 600 plus pounds within 25, 30 minutes. And, and that's including a 10 minute walk. So, I mean, that, to me, that's, 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 the quick. Ideal. that's quick. That's yeah. quick. Yeah. So Definitely, definitely see what you're, what you're getting at there. Um, Tony, but it's you a, to... can I interject one more time? Yeah, of course. But it's, it's cool because too, like, I don't know if you guys ever do this. And if you can, I think it's awesome. Is that you involuntarily put something in there that, you know, they don't know what it is not to hurt anybody. Right. But just to see if they'll communicate with you. No. Have you ever done that? I don't, I don't have, have, I don't so have as much trust in my clients as you do, I guess. <laughs> so I put, I put a, I'll put like a specific warm up in there. Right. It's not a bad one, but they're like, why did I do that, Tony? And I was like, you're a good client. Oh, I put stuff in there to make sure to like test their communication. Yes. That's what I do. Like what? Like it says, did, ham, did you... it says, it says hamstrings, but there's no hamstrings underneath of it. Why isn't there any hamstrings underneath of it? I go, because that's next week. I'm already preparing you. Oh, Okay. No, my favorite is like, I'll ask them the next day. I'm like, how did you like this drill? Oh, you know, it was great. I'm like, you have no idea what the fuck that drill was, do you? <laughs> <laughs> they're, like, they're like, uh, no, I didn't do it. <laughs> All right. Um, the, if we're, if we're good on that, I wanted to touch on, I think you've done a pretty good job building your social media in a way where it's like giving out free content to drive your business, but doing so in like an ethical manner. Right. Mm-hmm. We, we see a lot of people put out, especially recently, like these inflammatory posts. It's like some some inflammatory caption followed by this nebulous exp- explanation of something, whereas just to get views, mm-hmm. whereas your content has, has typically been very much outcome oriented. So it's like or output oriented. So you're putting out into the world. And you're like, I think this is valuable. Here you guys go. Not to ruffle feathers or, or you know, make a name for yourself or whatever, but just to, just to put things out in the world. Do you have a, any advice for coaches wanting to get more out of their social media or, or get more eyes on them at this point? Absolutely. I, um, I always tell coaches that they want to use my stuff. They're more than welcome to use it. Uh, that's why I'm public. They can repost it. They can use the exact same video. They want to share it. They're more than welcome. They can. Um, I have a few coaches here that work here. Um, they're doing amazing. They're building their own businesses because like I said, I want them to build their business with me. I think it's the coolest thing in the world to watch. Uh, so I require them as a contract. I require them to do one educational video a week. Um, yep. So, and I take a big, a big hit off of them for percentage wise for their, what they paid to train here. Um, but they do an educational video once a week. And I say, Hey, if you do it right, you should get one client, which pays your monthly here. You know what I mean? 
Uh, so I help them understand how to break even on expenses. So, Hey, if you're paying me hundred bucks a month, or 150 bucks a month, what can we do to get you a client that you'll break even on that? Now, what can we do to put you over that? So now you're using me as continuing education. Um, also for the videos, it's unreal. Never, never would have thought they would do what they do. Um, it's a lot of fun, but I do the videos for guys like you and Tony in the sense of, I have a glossary, I have it all organized. So all these videos, I have 606 videos right now. And they're all mm -hmm. organized by dysfunction, limitation, static, dynamic, right? So, for example, if you guys want to use it, I know the way you'll use it. Please, you know, take advantage of it, you know. But you can actually go into your Google Drive, click and send, click and send, click and send, versus having to look for it through the Instagram page. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So it's super easy just to grab and go, grab and go. Uh, to tell a coach what to do, I would tell a coach personally, talk about what you know. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't, someone's going to call you out. And if they call you out, you got to be prepared for the repercussion. And I think they call that trolls on Instagram. Um, I welcome them because I think it's a lot of fun. A lot of the trolls, I guess, whatever you would like to call them, yeah. I, I get become clients. Huh. So I welcome the challenge in the sense of, I love being able to talk. For example, the one I just, I just posted the concentric pushups, right? Mm -hmm. The guy, the guy was like, Hey man, blah, blah, blah. This doesn't work this way. doesn't work that way. And I said, I'm sorry to hear that, but this is the way I believe this is my philosophy. And he was like, wow, like, he's like, no reper repercussion. And I was like, no, I'm gonna tell you why it works and how it works. And he's like, bro, like my shoulder, that's the best my shoulders ever felt doing a push up. I got to regress all the way down to the last plate. He's like, what can you do for the knee? So then he signed, he signed up. That's funny. I got a troll and he became my business partner. Yeah. <laughs> that's what I'm saying though. It's about how you say it, right? <laughs> it's about it's fucking right here. I don't appreciate that at all. <laughs> all love, uh, buddy. Uh-oh, it's my first podcast and my last, huh? <laughs> no, 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 no. We're good. Um, was there anything, uh, any other questions that you had, Tony Montgomery, that you want to touch on? Yeah, uh, something that I see a lot when it comes to, like, strength athletes, power athletes, anybody that does a lot of bilateral movement is um, they, they lack their ability to do any type of internal, external rotation of the hips, mostly internal rotation of the hips because they neglect a lot of single leg work is that something that you see very common like how do you get someone to get rid of that bilateral deficiency doing unilateral work and is that something that you you try to work on a lot uh with, yeah. with your athletes and stuff Are you, you've seen that be a problem area a lot for them 100 percent. so I, I always want to distinguish between functional and structural right because sometimes you can't control what mama gave you so if you can look at functionally structurally the difference right so if it's bilateral most times it's something functional like a restriction right so then if you lay, say, for example, you did something active, right? So you had them do like a squat, say it was a narrow stance, wide stance, moderate stance, whatever it was, like which one felt better. You get to see like what they say, right? Then you can lay them down and test them passively. So I guess more into the clinician, but uh, trainers and coaches aren't allowed to do that, right? In the sense of they're not treating, they're just assessing. So you lay them down, for example, I love the one you have them prone face down, you take the leg, bend the knee, and you have the heel go right to the back of the knee, like that popliteal fossa. A lot of people can't touch that. You're supposed to be able to go to that full range. So like you guys might try it later tonight. If you can't go all the way there, all right, there's definitely a dysfunction or limitation. Let's try the other side. Try the other side. Oh, it's bilateral. Okay. So now let's test internal, internal. Oh, internal, internal are the same too. All right. You can tell by that range of motion where they are going to feel comfortable. So if they have more external rotation, right, that means that they can do a lot of flared out squat. That's probably why they feel better with a toe out. I'm not saying cocked out to like a nine o'clock and a three o'clock, but more of like a 11 and a one. They're like that just feels really good to me. All right, let's, let's keep that and build that and progress that strength. Right. Or for example, if they can only do an increased range of motion with internal, right. The feet turning out, that means they'll be more of a neutral squatter. So I'm not saying they have to uh, follow or obeyed by these laws, but they're going to feel more natural and they're going to feel more violent and more aggression in that movement. If they're not timid now, now they can explode and they can exert. A lot of people are timid because they don't really understand their technique. And so for me, like when I did, uh, when I did single ply in high school, I had a very good coach that taught me technique, taught me technique. I did a lot of static strength of just 45 pounds for the bar, for the squat, for the bench. And so then I put the shirt on, it got me top end. So now when I'm benching raw now, I'm like, in my head, I'm like, I know I can hit this. So a guy like Tony Montgomery at Record Breakers go, 402, you were sandbagging, Tony. Yeah. Oh, you were. 
fair, fair assessment. It's still a PR though. You know what I mean? Right, right, right. Yeah. Yeah. So when it comes to that type, cause I'm, man, I'm always so worried about athletes regressing them down to, to certain patterns and doing certain things. Right. I always mm-hmm. think about that. It's like, let me start them with the lowest barrier of entry so that we're able to continue to progress them and progress them. So if you have an athlete who maybe say you have them doing Bulgarian split squats, Correct. right? And that's like your first introduction to single leg work, which is a very complex single leg exercise, right? And then they're like, I just can't do it, right? I'm a, I'm a 600 pound squatter, but I can't do Bulgarian split squats body weight. And which is like, amazing because that means they're probably a wide squatter. They don't have no idea how to use their legs. Right, exactly. So you can already tell the pattern without seeing them. Right. But then you're like, okay, well, clearly you're not good at this. So let's find a way to load that. Then you have to regress them down to maybe a um, supported split squat, right? Where mm-hmm. they're, they don't have to worry about balance or stability. How do you, how do you deal with athletes that have to regress? Do you always start with regression first and then progress them? Or do you, it, dep- it depends on their experience. So for example, a guy like that, right? You can already tell that he might be a wider squatter. Nothing wrong with it, but that means he's using a lot of hips and a lot of back. So how can we give him more gas? Perfect example, Bulgarian split squats. Perfect. Let's do it. So what you can do is that means his mind, mo- his mind motor is completely off, right? He's not comfortable, doesn't like it, has no confidence in it. So what you can do, not even regression, but you can add assistance, right? Modify it by giving him, because you have these planes, right, that we lift in. You treat in those planes too. You have your coronal, right? So you have that frontal plane, which abduction. Then you have sagittal, right, which is flexion extension, and you have transverse, which is all rotation. So if you can combine all three of these planes in your secondary, the athlete flourishes. So if you put in a bench on their side, right, for them to support and hold, and now have them perform the Bulgarian, guess what? They're living in that sagittal plane, that flexion extension, but they have that confidence. If they need that, they can grab onto it. Eventually, then for the progression, we can pull the bench out, and you're like, hey, look at you now. And I, I guarantee it, that squat probably went up by 40, 50 pounds. Yeah, but is there a way to start, like, is there a way that you assess them to start them at that regression pattern, right? Like a lot of, a lot of athletes, I think of in terms of prescribing them some type of correctives is like gatekeeper stuff, right? It's like, yeah, you know, I'll have them do walk in lunges just to see if they have the balance and the coordination to do a walk in lunge to see if that back foot externally rotates or internally rotates to alleviate some stress in the hip. I know what you're asking now. I know what you're asking now. I do more of a, I do more of a preference of, I like doing closed chain in the sense of they're stationary, right? So they could do like a hat field reverse lunge, holding on the bar, reversing back, right? Cause you can already tell the gate. Cause if you were to add locomotion to it, right? It's going to speed up the air. So if you do it stationary, right. now, now you understand, all right, they're not stepping back far enough, right? With the stationary. So I guarantee they're not going to do it if they're walking, you know, if they all of a sudden they change it to open, oh, there's my air. So, so then with the, with the so, ahead, so, so then if you're, if you're starting them off on this regressed pattern that doesn't require a lot of stability, do you add stability exercises into their correctives or into the end of their workout to build up some of that stability? Or do you just progress them naturally within that movement pattern from um, something that is externally stabilized to something that down the road is internally stabilized? Yes. I like to progress them with more of a static because I want to see how well they can do it. So I'll increase the rep range from a 10 to a 15. And sometimes mm-hmm. go up to a 20 because I really like that static strength, for example, like low back, right? If you do the Roman chair hyperextensions, you know, all of a sudden, if you, if you can't do 20 of those easily, that means your posture muscles are not working. So what are you going to do if you add weight? Those posture muscles are going to turn off instantly, meaning that the lats got to work harder and extensions got to work harder because all those supporting muscles aren't firing. So I like to add more of a rep range in the sense of, but super light body weight to understand that they understand that movement and they have it under control. Then I can add like a band doing like a pal off or like the plate or weight, whatever that is. Yeah. Now you've mentioned this idea of muscles firing and not firing a couple of times now, right? And you hear that a lot. You hear people say, you know, oh, your glutes aren't firing. And that's why you have issues with your knee caving in on the squat. And you, then you'll have some people say, well, if your glutes aren't firing, how the fuck are you standing up with weight on your back? Your glutes have to be working somehow some way right so is it is it a is it a on and off thing is it a firing or not firing thing is it a dysfunction like what exactly does that mean because i've heard that be debated so much of like your there's no way your muscles are actually turned off right right so you you get that you get that technique right and you get that farmer technique right so like you have these kids that are like freakishly strong but they have no technique yeah you see you see them come you see them come into the sport as fast as they go out 
you're like, man, what happened to that guy? He never got to learn technique. He just had that genetics that he was just strong, man, just strong. But if you add strength with technique, that becomes, you know, elites, international elites, world record holders, right? And they stay around for a while. But with that, with it's it's fascinating because you got to understand that stretch reflex, right? With the eccentric and like concentric. But if you can do the isometric, right? The transition, the amortization, if you understand that, like things change dramatically because isometric is king. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's, and you're, you're exactly right. That's why I like to do a lot of my squat. If people have issues that do a lot of more isometric things where they're having their own isometrics within their body, as opposed to isometrics on, on a box. Right. But I understand both, both under like the ability of doing isometrics in general is, is good. I just prefer it to be more of within their own competencies of the movement more so than, um, onto something or air into something, so to speak, but interesting. I, I agree. Yeah. Yeah. Did I answer or did I, did I not? Um, I already forgot the question to be honest with you. So I'll say I, kind of, but kind of, but kind of, but kind of not. So like the, the question pertained to like turning muscles on versus off. Oh, so yeah, yeah, someone yeah. who squats with in we'll call them inhibited glutes or, you know, inhibited, like, I don't know, Usually it's, usually it's glutes, right? It's like yeah, always glutes, glutes for some reason. Gluteal amnesia. Um, that was, that was the term when I was coming up. So, so they're not, they're not, amnesia. they're not necessarily off. Right. So imagine like a house, right? What room in your house haven't you been in in a while? It's still a room, right? right? But you haven't been there as much as, for example, you might be in this room, Paul, a lot more because of podcasts and clients. Right. And you're like, mm -hmm. man, I, I haven't been in my shed in a little bit. I'm gonna go check. You go in the shed, you turn the light on it, it flickers and goes out right same thing with the muscles there's still power going to that but it's are you using the power that's in that room yeah yeah so so then how do you how do you get to use that power then is it is that's is and that's it, where you get into the dynamic and the static right so if you statically prep that power right the static is walking into the room understanding hey this is the room right i'm gonna go through everything all right the tvs all work but that light's not turning on right so now what can i do dynamically to turn that light on the last part of the room so I'm gonna do my lateral monster walks. Man, my hips were firing like a son of a gun, right? Wow, now you get a double whammy. My knee pain is starting to alleviate because the hips are turned on. Now let's see how you perform. Let's squat. Squats felt a lot better, but it's still like a two or three out of 10. All right, that was when we talked about the pain scale. It's below a five, but it's more of a nuisance. So we're, we are winning, but our ultimate goal is to get to that zero. So it's more of a... So I've, I've always looked at this problem as like a positional awareness. So whenever someone's like, oh, my glutes don't turn on, it's like, well, no, your glutes are turning on, but you're not moving in a way that leverages them the best they could be leveraged. Right. So I look, then I look at joint angles. I look at position, like positions within the pattern. So if we're looking at a squat and you see someone's knees just completely cave in, like maybe you just need to fucking narrow your feet a little bit. Exactly. That's the position. Right? Like, so so I'm always looking at not necessarily turning muscles on and off, but being able to access the ranges that they work best within. So your idea of static, like static to get in there and like feel it around. So if you've identified that, you know, maybe because my internal rotation isn't as great, I can't get into that, you know, good stable position in the bottom of my squat. So maybe I do a little bit of a little bit of static work to get into internal rotation then I want to make sure that I dynamically move to quote unquote activate. So you mentioned the lateral monster walks. Personally, I would probably just do a walking lunge or something like that with like a long stride. Um, but then now I'm like, okay, my glutes are, I feel my glutes working. And that's, then the I can, that's the blood flow, right? Because when stuff becomes right. ischemic and there's no oxygen, that's when pain presents. That's when you get trigger points, right? Or that satellite pain. So rehab is almost identical to strength training. So if that blood flow isn't present in those muscles, guess what? They're tight. You ever go down and be like, man, I sat on the airplane way too long. My knees are aching, right? All of a sudden you stretch the adductors, right? The hamstrings, and then you dynamically warm up the glutes and you do your squat. It's like, you never were on the airplane ever again. Mm -hmm. Like it's understanding what works best for you in the sense of that might work great versus someone sitting in a chair doing isometric, you know, holds with the adductors or isometric holds pushing out. Like everybody's got their preference, right? Like mm -hmm. me, I like Nike. Some people like Adidas, right? Nothing wrong with it. Suck. <laughs> Not, nothing wrong with it, but it's still a shoe, right? Right. The purpose is to wear it, put it on, tie it, use it, right? So it's just that preference. 
me, I, I like prepping the body statically, understanding what's going on, right? Understanding, feeling it out, and then dynamically turning on what I felt was restricted. Makes sense. Jenny, any other questions, Tony? I touched on what I wanted to, to ask about. Uh, no, I'm good right now. Oh. Cool. Do you want to take us home? You're, you do the outro. <laughs> you're, you can be the alpha for the outro. I appreciate it. I just assumed when you were talking about Alpha and Tony, you were talking about the other Tony on the podcast. But that's oh. cool. If you want to take shots at the guests, that's fine. That's why we don't have guests come on the show anymore. Listen. But anyways. It's because you scare them away. Maybe. Possibly. Um, <laughs> So Tony, if people are interested in uh, learning more about you and, and kind of getting your philosophy down and also your free content so they can steal it and present it as their own and pretend that they know what they're talking about. Very um, important. Yeah. Very, very important. How can people steal your content and follow you <laughs> on social media? Uh, they can follow me at Rogers Reset. It's uh, R-O-D is in dog, G is in George, E-R-S. People spell it wrong all the time. Yeah. Uh, they, they could go on online. I have a website, www www.rogersreset.com i do the coaching i do the therapy i do the treatments um but yeah that's pretty much it if you want where's to your me. yeah where's your gym located at in florida i'm in fort lauderdale just off of uh 95 oh okay okay do you ever spend any any time with phil Daru? i haven't yet everybody's trying to connect us i haven't uh, got to meet him yet we keep uh missing each other he's a good dude he's a good dude do you, are you familiar with the, man, okay. Are you familiar with the functional range conditioning type stuff? The, yes, the card, what do you, what do you think about that as a principle of building and ranges of motion and things of that nature? Um, it's, it's pretty new to me. I'd look more into mm -hmm. it. Um, but I love that, you know, something, somebody found something that works, uh, me and my personality. I want to know why it works. I want to learn more about it before I can judge it. Oh, okay. I mean, I, mean, I like that. I, that's a like that answer a lot. Yeah. Yeah. That happens in society. I was talking to Emma about that the other day. It's like, there's so many times where people are so quick to like tell you about this other person that you're interacting with. And it's like, I haven't seen this within this interaction whatsoever, but everyone has an opinion on like, this is what that person's all about. And it's like, have you ever spent time with this person? It's like, no, but I've heard this about this person. It's like, wait, <laughs> you, you, you can't even form your own opinion about shit. It's like, yeah, I like that, that answer. More people should be thoughtful uh, about their approaches when, when things like that. It also goes back to what Paul was talking about earlier, where people was talking such binary terms of you should only squat an internal rotation. You should only bench press with protracted shoulder blades. It's like, you should then why, never... then why are you doing secondary? <laughs> right. Right. All these very, all these variations, if you're doing all these variations. So why, why? Exactly. Exactly. Awesome, man. So appreciate your time. Appreciate you coming on the show and uh, giving us some insight into your conceptual ideas of, of how you do the rehab and how you go about your approach. Really appreciate it, man. Yeah, thank well, you. Thank you, guys. How do we do it again? Whenever. Uh, you just let us know when you want to, and we'll send you an email. Awesome. Let me know if I can be more uh, detailed or stay more on point with your questions or stuff like that. <laughs> I mean, hey, man, I no, you did a great job. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So make sure you guys go follow Tony. Appreciate you for listening. If you enjoy the show, Go to iTunes, leave a review, five-star rating. It is on Coach's Corner, iTunes, uh, SoundCloud, and Stitcher. And we'll catch you guys next week.